for the first uh, speakers of this afternoon session, we'll be started by a presentation uh, done by Professor Robert Dickey. He will be talking about ethics in English language teaching, the classroom and beyond. He will be talking about issues that concern teachers, also the learners and inside, uh, both inside and beyond the classroom. Um, uh, Professor Dickey, this is the first, second time you join this conference with us and we are so uh, grateful that you have the time to join this uh, third uh, conference of ICELIS. With the, uh, before I give the mic to you, let me briefly uh, read your biography for the participants. Uh, Professor Robert Dickey has been teaching in Korea since 1994. He holds master in public administration and Jewish doctor degrees that includes studies in professional ethics along with other courses in ERT. Uh, he was former editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Law, Language and Discourse. He has written and spoken on professional ethics frequently, as well as lead, led various diesel training courses. Professor Dickey has faced tough ethical dilemmas that require hard choices with serious outcomes like quitting jobs, but uh, uh, he has grew up in multi-ethnic communities and currently uh, enjoying aware of how cultural differences impact behavior and attitudes in almost all subjects, including language studies and ethics. Okay, that's simple, very brief outline of Professor Dickey's biography. Uh, he will elaborate more on what he has experienced through the years of his professional career. But without further ado, Professor Dickey, I hand over the microphone and uh, screen to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me just go ahead by starting to share my screen. <clears throat> okay. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm not sure how many folks are here, but we move forward and maybe some people will join us as we go. Uh, gotta get, uh, there we go. So what are the first thoughts that come to mind when you hear the word ethics? Okay, even before you say anything, probably your body language was pretty negative. Oh, more of that ivy tower or uh, ivory tower or ivy covered tower rubbish, stuff that doesn't affect me as a teacher at all. I know, um, when I first learned ethics, way 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 back when that's exactly how i felt why are we listening to this rubbish well that's interesting let's try that again but we're not going to talk about the academia conceptualizations of ethics we're going to talk about classrooms we're going to talk about classroom teachers we're going to talk about students we're going to talk about colleagues, peer relations. We're going to talk about the kinds of things that really impact your life any given moment of any given day. Conscience, choice, honor, value, integrity, moral or morals, principles, honesty, right versus wrong, fairness, responsibility. I'm going to stop here for a moment and point out that I'm trying to be ethical. That means if I steal somebody's image, I should give that person credit for their image. In my classroom, in my presentations, after all, if I'm going to tell students 
no cheating. Don't copy somebody else's work. Shouldn't I hold myself as a teacher to the same standard I'm holding my students? No copying, no cheating. What are we thinking of when we think of ethics? Well, let's throw a few more ideas out there. More etiquette? How does etiquette fit into ethics? Hmm. So we're going to have to <clears throat> think about this and we're going to think about it together. I don't have all the answers. And, and part of the discussion of ethics is the process of ethics, pardon me while I turn my page here. Part of, the, part of the issue is the process. What I want to suggest is that people create ethics. And sometimes that is on the fly, in the heat of the battle. At the moment you're standing in front of the chalkboard. Ethics is not just teacher codes, you know, those things that somebody writes and tells you, this is, this is ethics. There's too many books on ethics. There's not very many books about English teacher ethics. But teacher ethics, there's too many books. There's too many rules. We need to prepare for our own ethical crisis. This is what one teacher told me in about five minutes of one graduate school class. And it stuck with me forever. There's going to come a point in your life as a professional when a question arises and you're going to realize Oh, my goodness. Uh, what's the right answer? Right as in ethical answer. What's the, what's the correct answer? I, I, I can do this and it's easy, but what will other people think? I could do this, but what will my students think? Or I could do that, but what is my senior teacher or principal, uh, president, or whatever, senior officials, going to think? Or how does that fit into some rules? Maybe those rules don't fit my situation. And you can lose sleep. And you can lose heart. So what my graduate school professor said in, in one short time in class is, we need to think about our own ethics before the crisis, before the emergency, we should have an idea of what we think we should do in broad terms, our own set of rules. And then when the crisis comes, we just can pull our rules out and say, here's how it fits or here's how this doesn't fit, and it can relieve much stress. Because as teachers, we're busy. We don't have time for a stress timeout, right? We, we need to move on to the next lesson. We need to move on to the next student. Successfully complete what we're doing, move on to the next one. We don't have time to spend hours and days questioning what we did, why we did, what we should do. So we prepare, and that's what I hope today we'll do. I won't give you answers, but I hope I will encourage you to think a little further about your own ethics. So in this session, we're going to start off introduction as normal. We're gonna talk about ethics in your classroom, which could be different than ethics in my classroom. 
we're going to talk about ethics beyond the classroom, such as with peers. I understand I have about 40 minutes plus question and answer time. So that's my target. So introduction in the classroom, beyond the classroom. So here are some terms of art, the words you will see when you are reading about ethics. Morals, values, rules and regulations, codes, standards, norms, ethics, professional ethics. So I'm going to take a moment, as a good teacher should do, and invite you to think about your own interpretations of these words. What do you think they mean to you? Okay, uh, 60 seconds, think about them. How are they different? Okay, before I go further, I want to say thank you to the conference team, the conference managers. As Linda mentioned, I was here last year. And if you might see while we're talking, I'm drinking some coffee. Uh, actually, you can't see the mug very well because of that virtual background, but it's there. And I happen to be drinking. Let's see if this will show up. Uh, hardly. Copy Timor. Uh, it was a gift set that was sent after the conference, and I want to say thank you to the, to the advisor for that. Okay, so what are these words? Uh, what could they mean? Now, as language teachers, you know that almost every word we can think of has more than one definition. And in fact, language scholars can argue about meanings of words. That's why we have professors, right? So they can write books and articles and argue about things. So these are just one set of definitions and, and yours can be different. All right, so term of art can be defined differently by other people. But for me here, morals feel deep in the heart and you can't my camera's a little too low you can't see deep in my heart it's a sense of right and wrong typically taught by your family by religion okay so the religious teachings often tell us that we should do this we should not do that right that it's wrong to do this morals Values, on the other hand, I treat this as a sense of good or bad. For example, fashion. Values are typically shared, not taught. Uh, they, are, they are more like social values. You're more likely to get your values from your classmates and your friends. I think this is good. I think this is nice. You shouldn't do that. Rules and regulations are these strict ideas of what you must do or must not do. They're generally decided by government or by your employer. Uh, some people would say that within your religion, there are rules and regulations. That's kind of hard to, to interpret. I would say that if you are very, very faithful and a firm uh, 
follower in the teachings of your religion, then you might adopt rules and regulations from there. But in general, we would say they are from a higher authority, typically government or employer. If you are teaching in a state school, you certainly are aware of rules and regulations. Codes then are organized rules and regulations because the rules and the regulations might be passed by the uh, government this year and then more rules next year. But we put them together and we sort them out and we say this section is about this and this section is about that. So codes, rules, regulations, we as teachers have no say in this at all. Standards. Standards are expectations. For example, that you must finish your class in 40 minutes. If you go to 42 minutes, well, the bell is already rung. You're holding up students. They need to travel to their next class or they need their break. So we have standards set by the authorities. And we include professional standards there, just as we have standards for, let's say, uh, auto mechanics or dentists. There's certain things that we're expected to do for sanitation, for consumer rights. And some of them are going to be laws and some of them are gonna be set by their professional bodies. Norms on the other hand are expectations set by our peers, what our fellow teachers indicate to us is normal. And they'll let us know quietly that we aren't necessarily following the standard. If you work in a factory, for example, the norm might be that we only work this fast. And if you work too fast, other people will kind of give you the elbow and say, hey, 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 slow down, you're making us look bad. So norms are set by peers. And finally, ethics is a system or code of conduct, a concept of what is principled behavior. When I say principled behavior, I mean that people can see what you're doing and understand why you're doing it. And therefore, they can expect that you will do similarly the next time. But you seem to have some rules, some principles in your head that are guiding your behavior. So that's ethics in general. Professional ethics are a little bit different. Personal ethics are set by yourself, and they're strongly influenced by the morals and values that you have adopted. You've gotten from your family, you've gotten from your friends, and you have made them yours. Personal ethics is what other people see how you behave, and they say, oh, he's ethical, or he's not ethical, because we understand the kind of rules that he's working with, and he's not following them consistently. On the other hand, someone could say, I don't know what your rules are. I think you're unethical because you're not following my rules. So then we have the challenge of, well, I'm acting ethically, but he thinks it's not ethical because I'm not following his standards. So that's the challenge with personal ethics. Professional ethics, on the other hand, are based on rules, codes, standards, and norms all these things that give guidance to professionals. And professional ethics are based on the judgments of others. So I think I'm professionally ethic isn't relevant, doesn't matter. So what happens is what they think, how they interpret professional ethics might affect you. And if we're talking about people who are not professionals, example, parents of the kids we teach, they may not understand our professional ethics. They may not understand the standards and rules that teachers are expected to follow, and therefore the parents don't understand. In my school today, today, Saturday, I teach on Saturdays, I ran across a big problem because the department chair shared my tests with all the students. And what on earth happened? How could this happen? This is their graduation test. They have four different subjects they have to pass. And the department chair ch shared my test with all the students. So now I'm going to have to make a new test. 
So I'm asking, what were you doing? He said, well, I was, uh, I was uh, pooling your test. What does that mean? I, I don't understand. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying, I don't understand what you're thinking. Because now the students have seen my test, I have to make a new one. Oh, well, there was a miscommunication. Uh, okay. I don't know what that miscommunication was. All right. We can do this in English. We can do this in Korean. It means the same. But anyway, uh, professional ethics. What I thought we were doing is not what he thought we were doing. So now I look bad because I gave him a test that he shared. How does that work? I don't, I don't get it. Right. So professional ethics is how other people judge your behavior. And as with personal ethics, consistency, being the same, is a mark of professional ethics. So that's where we are. That's our introduction. Now let's get into the heart of things. It's already been 20 minutes. Here's how I draw ethics. That the base of everything is our life. Our family, our friends, our church, and our school, the other things that affect our basic morals and values. Because as an individual, if I don't think morally, I don't act morally, I don't have values that I act upon, there's no basis for ethics. And my professional ethics adds rules and regulations, codes, standards, and norms to that tier of ethics. If I'm not an ethical person, how can I be professionally ethical? Now remember, personal ethics is really cornerstoned on me, my mind, my behavior, my thoughts. If I can't believe that I'm ethical, how can I be professionally ethical? If other people question my personal ethics, they're going to question my professional ethics. What this means is that my personal life is going to affect my professional life. So, where do we find professional ethics? Where do we implement professional ethics? Let's get into the classroom practices. Ethics starts with preparing for class. Have you ever walked into a classroom and said, I don't know what we're doing today? Uh, what page are we on? Okay, it's happened to me. I teach the same material, two different classes, and my notes weren't detailed enough, and I didn't prepare enough. And I walked into the classroom, and I know what we're covering you know, between pages 20 and, and 40, but I don't remember where we finished. That means I'm not ready for today. So preparing for class includes knowing the content itself. If you're an English teacher, can you explain the difference between is and are and how we use it? Most of us know the basic rule, right? Third person singular, third person plural, that's not bad. Designing the lesson, not just looking at the book and saying, okay, we're gonna do pages 21 to 25 today, uh, but really thinking about what do I want to do in minute one? What do I want to do in minute 21? What's my role? What's the student's role at any given moment in time? Uh, when I teach, teacher training courses, I really focus on lesson planning. The planning meaning not just, you know, a, an outline, but thinking about at minute 22, what's the teacher doing? What's the student doing? And what are our learning objectives for this class? So designing the lesson, preparing for what comes next. Before this class finishes, I should know what we're doing after this class. What are we doing in the next class? How does the next class tie to this class? What are our, what are our examinations going to look like? 
How does this class tie into examinations? And sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes that's okay. Not every lesson has to be tested. Not every lesson has to be teaching to the test. But we need to be aware of when we are and when we aren't, and why we are and why we aren't. How are we preparing for life after school? Students who are going to university, students who are after university going into employment or going to a master's degree or whatever, how are we preparing our students for life after school? And even to the point of how does this class prepare students for life after school? Not every class will, especially as you're working with younger and younger learners, but we should always keep in mind what comes next. Now, there's a, there's a problem with that that we're going to talk about later about vocationalization of education. You know, education isn't simply to get a job, but it's something we think about as we are preparing our lesson. Okay, part two is in the classroom. Part three is after the classroom. Educational objectives in the classroom. If you don't know what your learning objective is, you're not teaching. You're just killing time. So is it ethical to kill 30 minutes or 40 minutes or 50 minutes of your student's life in a useless class? No. That doesn't mean you have to be teaching English. There might be something else the students really need that moment of their life. Maybe you're supposed to be teaching uh, how to get over a tough test. You know, the hour before they had a math test and it was really hard and they're feeling crushed. The ethical thing for a teacher might be to throw away that lesson plan and work with the students in front of you right now. That might be your educational objective. Okay, so not having an educational objective in each class, I believe is unethical. But what that objective is, is something for you to decide. And maybe you've got these regulations and codes and national curriculum that are jumping down on you and telling you what you have to do, but you are the teacher and those are your students and you have a relationship. So part of your objective is to teach the learners in front of you. Because we all know that some of the educational issues are pretty ugly, not the kind of thing we wanna talk about, like social warehousing. If you study the history of education, you know that a lot of the schools were created, for example, in the United States in 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, they started to make education a requirement. Kids had to go to school because it kept them off the streets because it let their parents work. It was just a place to contain the kids. Now we were teaching them too. Well, not me, I'm not that old, but the, the, the aim was to teach them, but also part of it was warehousing. Just get them off the street, give them something to do. Similarly, there's the issue of the, the vocationalization of education. This is a real issue in Korea right now in university. That the traditional academic subjects, especially liberal arts, especially humanities, are being downgraded, the departments are being shrunk, fewer students are joining these departments and departments are being forced to get smaller or even close because there's no jobs there. Philosophy doesn't lead to a job. Psychology doesn't lead to a job unless you get a master's degree and get a license to be a, a psychologist or a counselor. If we're an English teacher, well, there's this kind of understood rule that, well, English will be useful in their future. English will be useful for national development. Is that why we're teaching English? 
Should we only be teaching uh, commercial English and forget about classic literature? Forget about uh, the joy of reading poetry? Now, I'm not a poetry teacher, but I recognize that it's a legitimate area in English. So are we, are we teaching to that? Are we teaching too much to that? As a teacher, I really have to think about what are my obligations? And sometimes my obligations don't exactly match the curriculum or the, the, the school mandated textbook to teach, you know, chapter 13 this week and next. How, how should I adapt that material so that I am consistent with my own ethical beliefs? Should we be bringing broader social issues into the classroom? Uh, global warming, social justice. Uh, is this our job? Should we be teaching this? I don't have the answer for you. The, the, the answer is ethics says we each have to make our decision. So while I can be uncomfortable with what somebody else is doing, if they are principled in their approach, they've decided what their educational objective is, it doesn't fly exactly opposite of what the law says, then they're behaving ethically. If you teach in a Christian school, then yes, you should bring the Bible into the classroom. If you're teaching in a non-sectarian school that is explicitly non-sectarian, then no, you probably shouldn't bring the Bible into your classroom. And for me, that one's pretty simple. But not everyone would agree. Okay? My background is in law. So I tend to say uh, the, the law is pretty strong. You have to have a really good reason to break the law. Broader social issues. I mentioned earlier the idea of teaching the curriculum strictly follow the book versus teaching to learner interest and needs. So, for example, if the book has a reading that's focusing on uh, the, you know, conjunctive, oh, God, who wants to teach that, right? Then maybe I have a different reading that teaches that language point just as well and also discusses global warming instead of discussing 18th century industrialization. Because you know, who really cares about uh, industrialization in 18th century England? Is that really important to Indonesia today? But global warming might be. So again, we're looking at our educational objectives. If the objective is a language point, maybe it's okay to substitute the material with something else to teach that language point and also teach some other issue that I think is more important. An educational objective could be to foster self-learning, to foster personal empowerment, to get students to love reading so that they will be lifelong readers. If students love soccer, football, maybe we call it. I'm American, I call it soccer. Then maybe we can bring in materials that will encourage students to read more in English about soccer. That would be okay. If we can get them to read more and enjoy reading, we're doing our job. So we're fostering self-learning, we're fostering personal empowerment. That's probably a good thing. What other concerns or issues do you have for your classroom? Education inflation, oh, excuse me, education in the classroom, ethics in the classroom. We're focusing on the classroom. What are the teacher-student relations? I've had too many teachers who stand there at the podium and they read their book and they talk like this. And there's no personal interaction. There's no heart to heart. And I've had other teachers who communicated 
just as well the material that we needed to learn. But there was an empathy. There were students who felt like the teacher cared. That if the student did something bad, the teacher could communicate that, but not damage a teacher-student relation. So what are the teacher-student relations? What do you believe in? How can you make that work? What are the materials that we use? Okay, we mentioned this earlier. Official materials, things you bring in. What are classroom standards? Now, a big controversy in many countries is the English only classroom versus the bilingual classroom. If you're in a country where all the students have a shared best language or strong language, is it wrong to use that? Uh, you know, if you go to the British Council to study English, they were going to have an English only classroom. It doesn't matter if every student in the room speaks the same language, the same dialect. It doesn't matter. That's their principle. And it's a private operation. They can do that. But in a state school, in a university classroom, is English only the best choice? I mean, I'm a native speaker of English, but I'll tell you that in my classrooms, I encourage students to use little bits of their preferred language to help them in their learning. Little bits. You know. How about English only zones around campus where we say this hallway, all students should speak English. Is that a good thing? What about competitive grading or sometimes called the curve, right? You can only have 40% A or whatever. In, in, this, in this COVID time, a lot of schools are increasing the number, 40% A, 20% A. Assignments, homework, what are your policies? Do students know why they're doing the homework? Is it just, you know, translate these 16 sentences and they don't understand why? I hated my math classes because I had so many homework assignments and I would do a bunch and say, okay, I know this and do a few, skip down and do a few, yeah, I know this. I got D's on my math homework. I got A's and B's on my math test. How was that homework proper as a student. I didn't get it. I hated it. So make sure students understand the reason they're doing homework. And it's a good reason. What are student preferences? Can we modify our classroom to fit better what students want? If they prefer projects, if they prefer portfolios, if they prefer certain topics, can we adapt to that? Do we think as a teacher that's ethical? Or do we feel as a teacher, I need to do this? You know, my morning class and my afternoon class should be identical, not because it's easy for me, but because I believe that's the right way to teach. What are our, what are our ethics on student assessment? I don't need to go further than that. That's a whole you know, semester class by itself. What are our student-student relations? How do we encourage students to work together? Of course, we'd love to have them have mutual respect, a feeling of community. Do students feel competition? Well, if there's certain grade requirements, that kind of pushes towards competition, but can we soften that? Is that my job as a teacher? I'll be honest, I'll tell you that in my classrooms, my midterm examinations are extremely hard. I'm not kind. I hammer them. There's more D than any other grade on my midterm. Now, I, I, I make that very small points in their final assessment. The difference between an A and a D is only like six points out of 100. If you get a D on my midterm, you cannot get an A plus in my class. That's just a, a simple rule. But I don't give Fs. There's no point in an F. A D communicates the message, you didn't do a good job. I grade my students hard because in Korean university, students tend to not work hard. And especially in a foreign language class, they kind of feel like it's a joke. So I really hit them hard on the midterm. And, and because what happens after that, they study very well, they learn a lot. And I think as a teacher, I'm ethically bound to promote learning. I'm ethically bound to promote learning. 
So I need to do things that will promote learning. And if students aren't studying, I need to get them to study. There's a carrot and a stick and I've tried the carrot and it doesn't work very well in my environment. I'm not in the best university. Middle grade at best. At the, at the highest ranking, I would say my school is middle grade. A lot of students are not motivated in university in Korea. Anyway, the carrot doesn't work very well for grades. It doesn't work very well for studying. But I believe I'm ethical to hit them hard. But I don't think it's ethical to, to then say, well, you can't have an A in my class because you did bad on your midterm. No, I don't think that. You get a D on my midterm, you can still get an A in my class. But you can't get an A+. Plus. So... That's kind of the things as teachers, we need to go home and be restless and think, oh, am I doing a good job with my students? The last part of our discussion takes about four minutes, I think, is beyond the classroom. And beyond the classroom simply means everything about being a teacher once we walk out of the classroom in front of students. Uh, the picture at the bottom right is a teacher's workroom in Korea. Typical middle school, high school teacher's workroom. And in some schools, homeroom teachers don't even have a desk in that workroom because they do their work in their classroom. But a lot of teachers do not have a homeroom, so they go work in the office. And so we can see that it could be noisy, there's a lot of stuff going on. But when you're working beyond the classroom, you're working with peers, your, your fellow teachers. Do you share information? Oh, I had a lesson plan. It worked really well. You might try this. Or I had a material. It worked really well. Or I had something that didn't work. I'm going to have to teach it again. Do you have any ideas? How do you teach page 17? How do you work with difficult colleagues, the colleagues who are lazy, always complaining, the, the colleagues that give you stress? You know, ethically, we need to find ways to deal with them. What about home life? Do you take your work home with you? <laughs> I think every teacher takes work home with them. That's the reality of being a teacher. At university, in elementary school, in private language schools, you take work home with you. But don't take your work home with you. What I mean is, it's okay to take things home for grading. It's okay to take things home to prepare for next class. But don't take the stress of your job home, right? Don't go home and kick the dog, yell at the wife, beat the kid, or beat the dog, kick the kid, yell at the wife, or, you know, which, whichever. Don't take your stress home. And don't bring home issues to class. But yeah, if you have an argument at home or you have an argument in the city, don't, don't bring that to your students. Okay? Our job is going to impact our life, but we want to make sure that we keep it ethical, that we keep a balance, that we draw fences. When we live in the community, we have two communities, personal and professional. Our personal community is things like we live in town and we meet our students in town. That's reality. Uh, did I shave today when I went to the store? Did I see a student and I didn't shave? How does that make me feel? My wife used to not let me wear short pants in the town that we live in because students would see me. And 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was considered not appropriate for adults, especially teachers, to wear short pants in the community. Now it's okay. The, the norms have changed. What's our reputation amongst our neighbors? They know we're a teacher. So what we do in our personal life affects how the community sees teachers. Our social life, especially if you're not married, but even if you are married, do you go out to town? Uh, you know, I live in a, in a country where drinking is very, very normal. And teachers go out and drink and they get drunk sometimes. And that affects how our friends perceive us. What's our reputation with businesses? Uh, do you have a credit card? Are you in debt? How does that affect how people see you? And then our town reputation means how the town sees us when it comes back into the classroom. The student says, oh, my mom says she saw uh, Professor Dickey at the store and he was angry. He was yelling at the cashier. 
that's going to damage our classroom impression. In fact, as teachers, we are living in a fishbowl. Society is watching us. In the professional community, we have peer working groups. Maybe you have study groups. Maybe you have teams in the, in the campus or across town working on projects. What about job announcements? We've all seen job announcements, especially at private language schools. And maybe it says something like, uh, only native speaker. Or maybe it says, only bilingual teacher. Or maybe it says, only woman. Or maybe it says, no old people. We have all these preferences or discrimination that we have to live with in job announcements, in promotion and retention. Okay. Indonesia is a country of a thousand of a thousand nations, we could say. A thousand nations, you know. So your grandmother's language, preferred language, might not be the same as my coworker's grandmother's preferred language. And as a small child growing up, growing up, I spoke this dialect and you spoke that dialect. How does that affect us when we're working together? What about professional development? Coming to a conference like this. The reading I do to keep up, not, not my coursework, but my, you know, uh, I want to read more. I'm reading a journal. Professional associations I join. And advocacy. Do teachers have a right to speak to education? Are we advocating for our learners? Are we advocating for languages? And are we advocating for the teaching profession or the language teacher profession or the high school language teacher profession, wherever. Advocacy, are we speaking for them? So as I close, uh, I'm a little over time. This is a few things I've done. I will make this PowerPoint available to everybody through the or conference organizers. It's a few things I've done. I'm not promoting what I've done, but you could also look at these things and find more sources, uh, things I've quoted that are good resources. So that's going to be my presentation for today. And I'm open for any questions or comments right now. And I'm open for uh, anything a bit later, but I do have a class in an hour. So I'm gonna have to go away at three, at your three, at my 3.30, your 2.30. Questions or comments? I'm looking at the message board now. Um, thank you so much, sirs, for your very interesting presentations. Now I have collected several questions. Please go ahead. Yeah. I, should I start with the questions? Wait, I'm going to share the presentations of the compiled uh, questions. Here they are. I hope you can see my screen. So the first question comes from Ms. Linda Rupidara, and the question goes to several classes I attended a few years ago at the beginning of all classes. Lecturers presented overview on how he or she will conduct the class throughout the semester, include the expected assignments students should fulfill and the grading mechanism. In your opinion, is it a good example to be considered as an ethical teaching practice? Thank you, sir. You may proceed with the answer. Okay, well, my first answer is that my opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Honestly, um, I'm only one person and I'm, and I'm outside your context. Having said that, it's a certainly a good step towards ethical practice. It would be unethical for students to not know how they're going to be graded. It would be unethical for students to not know what's expected. The question then becomes, would it be even more ethical if we negotiated the syllabus? If we said there's going to be a midterm, there's going to be a final. I can't change that. But whether the midterm counts for 20 points or 30 points, Let's talk about that. If the teacher has the ability to negotiate a syllabus, 
then it might be more ethical if the students are in a position to be able to negotiate. If you're teaching elementary school students, that probably won't work. If you're in university, we presume students are educated enough, maybe they would prefer to have more points for a report and less points for a paper test, okay? So yeah, I think it's ethical. Is it ethical enough? Question two. Thank you, sir. Now we move to question number two, and it comes from Ms. Santri P. Jaimo, and uh, she says, and I quote, Rob, when it comes to hitting students hard, how hard should it be? Um, so should it be to consider it as ethics? What's your experience? Okay, so um, as we started, we said that there's certain rules and standards you have to base it on, and it's all on this framework of your personal ethics, morals and values. So uh, somewhere in there in those morals and values, I believe that education is about learning. Okay? Not necessarily about passing a certain uh, test, but about learning, whatever that means. You know, Education, whatever that means, everyone has their own definition. So what I had said was that University students in Korea are known for not being good studiers. They're known for being lazy, especially first year students. And to be honest, fourth year students. First and fourth year students. First year students, because they've studied so hard in high school, they come to university and their first year is kind of vacation. And I've had university professors tell me don't expect too much. It's their first year, right? And I think that's rubbish. So when I say hit them hard, I mean give them a, ta a, a taste of what is expected in the future. Let them know that there are standards and that they will need to face them. So hit them hard means give them a hard test and score it hard but don't punish them too much, okay? Don't punish them too much. So it's a, it's a low grade, but the points are very weak. So that's what I mean by hard. And I believe it's ethical because it's consistent with my belief that they are there to learn and they need to wake up and that's how I can do it. I think it's ethical. Next question. Uh, question four, how should you proceed so as not to discredit yourself, your profession, or your practice? Would you work at the same time and maintain integrity and confidentiality in your actions? Um, well, first, I think confidentiality is a whole separate question. Uh, to violate confidentiality is certainly unethical. Okay, so we, we can accept that, that if you, if you violate confidentiality, that's unethical. But... Um, Oh, we, I'm on question number four. Please quit jumping. <laughs> uh, how should you proceed so you do not discredit yourself? It's all about the standards you set. So please remember what I said in the very earliest part of this discussion. That what my university professor told me, graduate school professor, is you need to think about your ethics. What are your standards? What are your policies? before the ethical crisis comes and decide what are your ethics, what are your policies, and then you can act according to those. When you don't know what you're doing and you don't know why you're doing, that's when you're ready to discredit your profession, yourself, and the practice. So set your standards. Was there a question three? or whichever you want to ask. Yeah, um, we have to ask questions from... Uh... Okay, fine. Mr. Uh, the news, yeah. especially at UNRI, cases of social harassment are happening again. A UNRI student admitted to being a victim of sexual harassment. What do you think about this issue? Um, I can't imagine anybody saying sexual harassment harassment is okay. It can never be okay. The fair question is whether or not it was harassment. 
And how do you decide that? That's a different question. Okay, that's a question that's set by by authorities. We get into these codes of conduct, these rules and regulations. Um, for example, at my school right now, <clears throat> if a student offers me a cup of coffee, I cannot accept. That's the current rule. It's a crazy rule, but it's the rule. So the 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 question of sexual harassment is: Is it harassment if the teacher says? Uh, miss, if you do something for me, I'll do something for you. That's clearly harassment. If the teacher walks by and touches her hair and she doesn't like it, that's almost certainly sexual harassment. So the real question is, what are the standards? And if, it, if there is a standard and you violate it, it's unethical. And if you break the rule, maybe you should be fired. Okay, so uh, this one's easy. Because th for sexual harassment, there are rules. The only question is whether you broke the rule. Uh, lecturers don't have ethics. That's what it seems like. If a graduate student walks up to a professor and says, well, professor, I'll do certain things for you if you give me an A, then of course the student is unethical. And if the professor accepts it, the professor is unethical. It goes both ways too. Girls can do for boys, boys can do for girls. So yeah, it's, it's unethical in terms of the offer and it's unethical in terms of the doing. No question about it. Thank you so much, for, sir. Um, we have one question left. It's from Ms. Dave, uh, Davy Bilbora and the question goes like this. Mr. DK, it is interesting that you have discussed this issue. It is such a new thing to be considered by the teachers nowadays. But one thing to ask, what is the standard that can be used in deciding the proper methods or topics of the material so it will be matched or hit every student's needs appropriately? Since, you know, the students come in a group. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'll be honest and say, I'm not sure this is an ethical question, but it's a hard teaching question. Um, you know, we have mixed level students, uh, mixed level classes. We have students with different interests. I don't believe you can ever catch them all at the same time. I do believe it is unethical to. And that goes both ways. That means teach the middle and the top and letting the, four, the, the, the poor students fall further behind. But it also includes focusing on them in the middle of the mixed class have to have mixed level teaching plans. We have ready to help And sometimes the sometimes more advanced at the bottom. Sometimes it means letting the middle and the top do something and the bottom. We focus on it's unethical to ignore any students, but I'm not sure it's an ethical question in terms of our uh, obligated to teach all of them. That is, that is a teaching environment problem that's beyond the teacher. Let's talk to the Ministry of Education or the provincial office or the school principal and say, why is this class mixed not appropriately? But I think it's an ethical teacher problem. It's a, it's a problem higher above us. Anything else? Um, thank you so much for your answer. And apparently that will be the last questions for your session. Now we may proceed to the next program and I will give back to Ms. Linda Rubindara. I hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.